Welcome to Healing Minds, Stories of Resiliency and Recovery, a conversation held at the intersection of substance abuse, mental health, and everyday living. Your hosts, Mark Regala and Justin Wolf, bring both professional expertise and personal understanding to the table. So welcome to the conversation. Let's dive in. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Healing Minds, Stories of Resiliency and Recovery. I'm your host, Justin Wolf, joined by my co-host, Mark Regala. So, Mark, how are you doing this evening? Doing pretty good. Middle of October, Halloween around the corner, weather getting cooler. It's getting into the, well, it's hard to believe we're even talking about possibly the holidays, but we're getting close to talking about them pretty soon. Yep, that is right around the corner here. But what comes first before that holiday season is my kids' uh, pixie stick binge that I can hardly oh. wait for where they're going to be like little goblins climbing trees and ravaging the take one candy bowls. So if you have one hanging out in your neighborhood, please remove those from your front doorstep. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I know. I'm just like, I, I appreciate the honesty that some kids actually do only just take one. And I'm just like, wow, you all are, you were raised right. <laughs> they're, they're one of those kids that said, daddy said to take more. Yep. <laughs> Well, my kid's running up there grabbing handfuls and saying, here, try it. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. So, no, I think this is just it's a great time of year, right? Season's changing. I mean, football season kicked off. All of these wonderful, we got baseball playoffs. So, great time of year. And I think it just kind of sets the stage. You know, when we're talking about the holidays, a lot of times it's dealing with families and relationships. And that's kind of what we're going to dive into tonight really kind of talking about what it's like to love and be in a relationship with somebody who's caught up in the thralls of their addiction and later on living a life of recovery and what that looks like, because those are two very different relationships, right? We talk about a lot of times in the treatment field and treatment industry where it's like, Hey, like recovery is good for the individual and it might not be good for your relationship. Because this relationship, from what you've been through together and what you've experienced, and then moving forward into recovery, two totally different lifestyles <clears throat> and two yeah. totally different patterns. And so I know, Mark, I just want to kind of like tap into your wisdom, man, and kind of get your insight about what does this look like? Well, I mean, they call addiction a family disease for a reason. I mean, everybody in the family is affected. Um, not necessarily, I mean, obviously by the behavior of the person that's battling, but also affected by what needs to be done to help that person achieve sobriety, recovery, and then long-term recovery. I mean, that support needs to be there. And what that support means changes. And with that change, those changes, it could be, you know, from alcohol being kept in the house, to what you do socially on the weekends, who you hang out with socially on the weekends. Okay, I mean, it's a complete adaptation of life to support your loved one, and it takes a special person to be able to do that, and not everybody can do that, and I understand and respect that. Right, because I think that's, like, at the core of it all, saying, hey, like, I love you. I don't love the disease, and so I need to be mindful of certain things in the environment that might actually set you up intentionally or unintentionally. And I, I've seen that kind of play out time and time again, where let's, let's just call it what it is, man. You know what I mean? Like in relationships, you like having the other person around the other person being there and feeling needed is always a good thing. And what you see happen in early recovery at times is that people start building foundations of support outside that home environment. And it looks like whether it's going to meetings, different self-care activities, learning to actually prioritize their own emotional and physical wellness, as opposed to putting everybody ahead of them. And yeah. so those actions can really pull away from some time that's being spent in that relationship, which can lead to resentment kind of entering the fold here. Yeah. in this dynamic what do you think man well 
I could see that happening, but at the same time, you know, I mean, there's open meetings out there where you can go to as a couple, you know, and I think that your partner or your spouse, if, you know, if, I don't want to say if they care, because they obviously care, you know, yeah. but, you know, if they have a vested interest or they want to learn more about recovery and how to support you as an individual, they they can go with you to those open meetings and learn about the disease of alcoholism, mm. the disease of, disease of addiction, what it takes to actually attain long-term recovery or what it takes to, to attain sobriety, and then possibly hear um, it from other alcoholics and addicts, but also other partners and spouses of alcoholics and addicts as well, and what they've had to do and what they've had to change in their life, you know, to support their, their partner or their spouse. Yeah. And I think that's such a great resource because it's like, you're talking about entering uncharted territory. People are like, I don't know what, where's the handbook? How am I supposed to handle this? What am I supposed no. to do? How am I supposed to handle all these different situ situations and scenarios? I'm not prepared for this and I don't have the wisdom or the knowledge. So those open meetings provide that door and that gateway, which is great. And I'll say this, for significant others that are willing to take that action, because not everybody is, and I've heard it, and I don't know, Mark, if you've heard this too, come up time and time again, go like, hey, you know what? This is their problem. They need to figure this out. Like, I don't need to stop doing what I'm doing, especially if, like, my per my spouse, my significant other is no longer drinking. Why does that mean that I have to stop drinking? Or why can't I just have my bottle of wine in the fridge? Why is that such a big deal? I mean, <clears throat> that's a sensitive subject there. Because if that's the mentality that you have and you really love that individual and you care about that individual and you know it's a matter of life or death for them to either get sober and then stay sober, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you're not willing to make those changes, then you almost have to ask yourself if you're if it's if it's time to let go of that relationship and let them move on and let them get healthy themselves. Because right. I can only speak from my experience. You know, if I was trying to get sober off of alcohol and drugs and I had a partner or a spouse that was, you know, drinking around me or keeping alcohol around me, I don't know if I would have been able to get sober, mm -hmm. you know, and then early recovery. And even now, you know, I've been sober for a number of years. And I mean, I still pick and choose my battles. Yeah. I pick and choose who I'm going to be around socially. And if, you know, if, if, if it's people that are going to tie one on every Friday and Saturday, I, I can't be around them. I choose, you know, wh where we're going to go or where I'm going to go. Um, certainly not going to be at a bar socially. I might go listen to some live music, but if I'm going to go listen to some live music, I'm going to get in right before the show and I'm going to get out right when the show ends. I'm not going to be there for an hour and a half beforehand and an hour afterwards where everybody's drinking, you know, because it's very triggering to me. I mean, it, cre it creates anxiety for me. And there's people, you know, that eventually get over that. And there's people that have been sober for 30 years and can't be around alcohol at all still to this day. Everybody's different. Right. And I think that's what people need to understand. I mean, there's going to be changes to your life. You know, um, socially, with the people that you hang around with, you know, there's going to be changes in friends. Just like for us to stay, so for me to get sober, you know, and stay sober, I got to change my friends. Well, if I got, if we hang out with couples that, uh, that aren't the best influence for me, for me to attain long term, we, we got to ask ourselves the question, does it make sense to continue to hang out with those couples? Right. Because, I mean, it's like dangling a carrot in front of me. You know, exactly. Eventually you're going to bite it. Uh, yeah. You know, and as far as the comment goes about why, you know, why, do I have to stop drinking? You know, why can't I keep a bottle of wine in the house or what have you? I mean, in addiction, it's hard to explain to somebody who's never had the battle, but I've heard this example and uh, it's actually pretty profound. It's have your cell phone sitting next to you and know you can't touch it. And you can't <laughs> check your messages and you can't check your texts. And every single time you have a thought to touch it, because it's sitting right next to you, you can't, and you can't touch that for every single day for the rest of your life. 
<laughs> it's going to be pretty hard pretty to do. spot on example, man. It's going to be pretty hard to do. Yeah. Well, guess what? If you're keeping alcohol in the house, okay, beer, wine, bottles of booze that's accessible, that's like that cell phone sitting in front of me. That's my addiction. Okay? That's my drug of choice. It's going to be hard to say no every single time I get that urge, especially early on in recovery. Right. Because I guarantee you this, people that don't struggle with mind-altering substances, alcohol or drugs, but, you know, they're, but they're addicted to that device, the phone, they're not going to be able to survive one day without touching that phone. Of course not. But we're expected to survive every single day for the rest of our life without touching our drug, or, drug of our choice. And that could be anything. I mean, that could be uh, actual drugs, street drugs. That could be prescription medication. That could be alcohol. That could be gambling. That could be shopping. I mean, whatever your drug of choice is, your drug of choice. But the partner or spouse needs to be supportive in that role if you're going to beat that addiction into submission and then attain long-term recovery. And I think that's so important to understand. No, I 100 percent that that cell phone example is fantastic like i wish i had that known that back in the day so now if you ever hear me reference a cell phone example you know that i got that from you so you can always take credit for that well, man. i stole it so i mean i can't it's even take you credit for right it. now it's all yours <laughs> it's, but no it's questions true. asked no and i think that's where you're talking about like hey is that significant other like i want to kind of be putting my like my like my partner here in position to be successful to thrive to show up and really kind of re-engage with the world as it is. And if me saying, and I remember having this conversation like in like family sessions and group sessions with spouses and significant others and family members kind of saying, hey, like I hear you, you're saying you don't have a problem with drinking, but it's the significant other, the other person that's got the issue with drinking. What message do you think you're sending that person by keeping that bottle in the house? Exactly. What are you saying to them? How can you communicate to them that you're saying, I'm behind you 100%. I care about you. I love you. I got your back. How can you say that and still keep this poison in your premises? <laughs> or what message are you sending because you want to go to the bar with your friends on a Friday, Saturday night and have a mm -hmm. couple cocktails? Right. It's like, oh, then I'm going to come home smelling of you. are going to smell it on my breath. Like, my, maybe I spilled on my clothes. Maybe I got a little, you know, maybe I slipped. But yeah. those situations can cause horrendous consequences because of what it can just trigger. You smell it, right? We've all had those like deja vu moments where you smell something and all of a sudden you're kind of like sucked back into like the past and you're no longer present. Your mind's kind of taking you on that adventure. That's kind of what ends up happening with addiction, right? Like your mind, it's like, Hey, I got, this is the road you want to travel. My friend, I'm glad yeah. you're back. Here we go. And no spouse or significant other or partner wants to be in position to say, Hey, you know what? I contributed to this, right? I put them at risk by a decision that I made. And I think that's when we talk about support because support is so critical here. And we can highlight all day what support's not, right? Because there's a fine line between support and enabling. <laughs> like those are two very distinct behaviors. But before we kind of, you know, kind of travel down that path, what, do you, what does support look like for somebody newly in recovery, Mark, look like for you, man? From a partner or a family member? Yeah. Like, what would you want from them? <clears throat> if you could give them advice, saying, this is kind of the roadmap you want to follow. Well, I mean, I would like to, them to take a proactive approach and educate themselves on mental health and addiction. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's important to understand. Um I want them to be loving. I want them to be caring. I want them to be understanding, you know, that I'm sick with a disease. Um, I don't want my past thrown in my face. Okay. And there are going to be things that I need to do uh, on a daily basis to attain the long-term recovery, like go to the gym and dietary things and mm -hmm. things like that. But you know what? I mean, you can do that together. You know, it's not, you know, and I've seen a lot of couples when one's battling and trying to get sober, 
the partner all of a sudden joins the gym with them and they're working out together and they're both benefiting from the habits that that addict that alcoholic needs in order to to stay recovered you know i mean both can benefit from dietary changes as well it's just a, mm -hmm. a healthier living promoting healthier living as a couple um you know and then the other thing is too is don't put me in an environment or don't go to an environment that's going to put put me in a potential situation for a relapse you know, I think that's important to understand, you know, whether it's a barbecue where people are tying one on or, you know, go see a band and there's a bunch of friends there and they're going to be drinking all night. You know, I mean, we need to be in a really, in my opinion, controlled environment, specifically in early on recovery. You need to be out of that environment completely when you're trying to get sober. Right. You know, I mean, you, I mean, that's just, you're not going to be in that environment at all. And then you got to be very strategic as far as who you're going to invite into your home, you know, as friends or couples or what have you, and, you know, and, 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 and not be triggering to the person that's the addict or the alcoholic because of their potential behavior, because they're drinking or tying one on or doing other things or whatever it might be. Yeah. I mean, just like me as an individual it has to change people, places and things, we as a couple or we as a family have to change people, places and things. And again, if the individual in the family or the partner or the boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife is not willing to do that, but you truly love the individual that you're a partner with, you have to ask yourself the question, if I'm not willing to make these sacrifices, is it just makes sense for me to cut ties? Because if I'm not willing to make those sacrifices, I'm jeopardizing this person's ability to get sober or stay sober. And... In a lot of instances, and we know this, Justin, it's a matter of life or death. Right. No, especially with the rates of overdose skyrocketing, suicide rates skyrocketing, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of danger. There's a lot of risk there. And I think that's where, like, that saying comes back in where it's like, hey, recovery might, might not be good for your relationship. And that's okay. <clears throat> and also, like, that support component. Like, I, you brought up an important point that I think is really critical to highlight. Actually, a couple there where first I want to kind of talk about like that education component. I think that's critical. Turning every corner you can to try and get that information so that you can be the best prepared in terms of knowing what does support actually look like and what is helpful to these to an individual in this position, right? Because I think some of the best intended actions actually create the most harm. Because it's like you look at like enabling. So we'll kind of dive there for a sec. Enable like. I'm trying to shield and protect this person from the negative impact of their choices of their use, because I don't want them to suffer or feel pain, right? That's coming from a place of love, but what it's creating is the shield that's actually feeding the very thing that they're trying to hopefully rid that individual of, right? We're saying, Hey, like, we don't want this behavior. We don't want the disease to kind of keep like taking the wheel and controlling your actions but by those choices being made that are shielding, and actually promoting and guarding that you're doing the very thing that you're trying to avoid. Right. Yeah. So that's, <clears throat> that's a key thing to kind of get that education component as well as what you said is like, Hey, let the past lie in the past. Cause I've seen a lot of people when they get in those fights, so those disagreements early on in recovery, what ends up happening is people get kitchen sinked. And it's no longer this argument or this dispute isn't just about what's happening right here at this time in this moment. It's here's history. And I'm throwing yeah. the entire kitchen sink at you because yeah. everything's coming at you right now. And the other thing I want to talk about too, is like when you start talking about somebody that's in active addiction and they're fighting like hell to get sober and they've been in and out of drug and alcohol treatment and in and out of the psychiatric unit and you know, there's an effort being put in and there's good days and bad days and maybe small stretches of sobriety and so forth, you know, and your partners with them. And I realize you want your space and I realize you want your social life and so forth. But if you start leaving them behind and going out and doing things that this individual craves and wants to do but can't do and you're leaving at home by themselves, mm -hmm. man, that's when that's when that addiction can take on a whole nother level. And that's when that depression can set in and lead to some pretty bad things. Right. You know, that's what I'm saying. There's some severe sacrifices that need to be made by everybody in the family. 
And I don't think a lot of people think about that. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm not worthy to go out with them because I'm battling this addiction. And all I want to do is go out with them and be able to have a good time. And now I'm left at home by myself because I'm sick or what have you. Right. So what am I going to do? Your mind's going to get in a bad, bad way. Right. It's like, see, I'm just a burden. I'm like a ball and chain exactly. holding me back from a good time. That's exactly what you're thinking of. Yep. It's exactly what you're thinking of. And then what else are you thinking of? I'm just better off dead. That's where the suicidal yep. thoughts come back in. Definitely. Or it's like, hey, I know how, I, how I've squashed this pain historically. I know what will take care of this, right? It just sets it up. And I think that's where you're Trick just like really speaking yep. on the importance of like that open communication. Hey, what is it that you need? What does support actually look like? Because I think that's critical, like in terms of naming it and like kind of getting that alignment and getting everybody on the same page because nobody can read minds as much as we all like to think we do. And like, oh, I know what they're thinking. I'm just going to avoid them. They're a jerk. Like, didn't get that magic power overnight. <laughs> Who are you kidding? Uh, but that's the part. And like, that's what people do is we tend to project these uncomfortable ideas that we carry onto that other person so that we don't even talk about we're just making assumptions and we're missing out on opportunities to really connect and come together because that's what this time is really all about is really building those bridges together and identifying what it is that's actually helpful and needed which is going to be a difficult conversation at times because on the other end it might be like hey i need to come forward and be honest with you but being honest with you also means that I'm going to, to acknowledge that I'm not working it perfectly. I'm doing the best I can with what I got here. And if you're expecting me to be perfect, well, then it's going to be really hard for me to be honest with you. Let's, and we're talking about partners, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives. But let's talk about, you know, the relationship, whether it's brother, sister, yeah, um, friends, you know, or parental. You know, I talk to a lot of youth that are struggling with alcohol and, and mind altering substances, drugs. And in some instances, I talk to their parents as well. And their parents don't understand why their son or daughter can't kick this, can't kick the habit, mm-hmm. you know, um, for whatever they're doing, whether they're going to the bar, popping pills, whatever it might be. Okay. And, 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 and they're so disgusted by the behavior of their, of their a child. And in some instances, like I said, a young adult or adult child, be at the parents are at the bar every weekend. Yeah. Doing their drug of choice, drinking, mm-hmm. you know, and, you know, from a, from a psychological perspective, you know, I'm th- if I was the kid, I'm thinking, okay, well, if you can do your drug of choice, my drug of choice is pills or this or whatever. Your drug of choice is, you know, drinking vodka or drinking beer. Mm-hmm. Okay. If you can't, you know, if you can do yours, I can do mine. Right. You know, I mean, it's all psychological, you know. So a lot of times it takes family members to step up and change their lifestyle as well to support that person that's struggling. Mm -hmm. I remember when my my dad's brother uh, was battling alcohol. Uh, I was about 12 or 13 years old, and I remember he was impatient. My dad was a heavy drinker a heavy drinker, but he actually quit drinking, cold turkey, and never had a sip of alcohol again to support his brother. Wow. Because he didn't want his brother to be alone at family functions and be the only one that wasn't drinking and things like that. Yeah. You know, thought that was very commendable of him. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and I think about it, it actually, you know, made sense. I mean, my uncle probably needed to have that support in the family, but a lot of people don't do that. Right. Kind of like That's the double sword. Do as I say, not as I do, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know, and then when and then I hate to say this, but when you're on the addiction side of things and you hear those actions, oh yeah, you're thinking of hypocrisy. Of course. Where's your credibility? It's gone now. Thank you. Exactly. Like- <laughs> exactly. So I think that's that's the part. It's like, hey, the power of like modeling that behavior. Modeling that behavior is critical at these times because you're kind of just modeling the expectation saying, hey, it's not just about you. It's about me saying I'm walking this path with you and I got your back. And so that means that I need to let this go. 
Because guess what? This relationship with you is more important to me. You matter more to me than this drink, drug, pill, powder, whatever it is. I'm going to let that go because I need to be here and I need to show up for you. And I know that these actions, this is doing nothing but possibly setting you up and sending the wrong message. Well, it's not a bad thing either. I mean, I mean, okay, if somebody cuts back on their alcohol or quits drinking along with their partner and they start hitting the gym, maybe not as often as their partner, but a couple of times a week, they change their dietary uh, menu and they start yeah. eating a little healthier. Guess what? Everybody in that household is going to benefit from it. Everybody in the yeah. household is going to benefit from it. You know, I mean, it's, sure. and, and I mean, there's, there's not a negative that can come out of it. The only perceived negative is I'm being held back from a good time. Well, is drinking really a good time? Right. It's like, you look at what's kind of driving that behavior, you're driving the drink. A lot of times like, hey, I'm just trying to get away. I'm trying to unload this stress. I just need to relax. And this is the only way that I've identified to do that. Well, it's like, hey, guess what? We've removed this. This creates an incredible opportunity now to find some different ways to take care of yourself <clears throat> without having to look at a substance or a drink to kind of take care of that for you. And guess what? That's really empowering because now you're realizing and you're learning I can really carry and experience these uncomfortable feelings and emotions. And I have the tools and the ability to go through it. I don't have to try and find some like shortcut to get away from it, try and get life to alter itself to what's reality. No, I can handle these difficult emotions, thoughts, and feelings because I've got some more resources in my belt. And guess what? I've got a partner next to me that's walking the same path with me and we can talk about it. We can actually air it out and have these conversations. That way I don't have to kind of bottle this all up inside to the point that something just explodes and I snap over what seems like really something inconsequential. I mean, I don't think that there's, I, I'm thinking right now, I can't name one negative. I mean, one negative, yeah. you know, for, again, we're talking spouse, but I mean, for a sibling to support a sibling yeah. or, you know, a parent to support a child, a child to support a parent. Yes. Okay? Um, and partners, husband, wives, boyfriend. There's not one negative. Everything in recovery and sobriety makes your life better. You're going to eat healthy. You're going to exercise more. You're, you're spending more quality time together. Uh, you're not tired in the morning and sleeping to 11 or 12 o'clock, wasting half a day because you're at the bar the night before. You're being a better role model to the kids in the household. If their kids there, you know, you're showing them the right way to live. I mean, can you name a negative? I can't. Outside negative. of your uh, sleeves getting a little bit tighter? Not really. No. Well, I just, I, that's, not a, that's, that's not a negative. <laughs> yeah, <Justin. laughs> I'm just buying my shirt smaller. That's all, man. Yeah. That's all that it comes down to. Medium. All day. <laughs> All day. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really, I mean, man, no it just what's going to come out is like, guess what? We're going to have open communication. We're going to have honest conversations, and that's just going to lead to having more depth to the actual relationship. So that goes such a long way. Or guess what? Like, there's no secrets, and like that's like you talk about the kids and the parents. Like that's one of like the most powerful relationships I've seen at play, where. Parents like, I want to set a good example for my children. Or guess what? The children go, you know what? I know my father's in recovery. I, I just ask him how he's doing every day. I just check in on him because I love him and I'm concerned about him. Yeah. And it's like, you know what? There's nothing wrong with that. It's like, it's not like the kid is the caretaker. It's just saying, hey, you know what? Like, I know all the effort and energy you put in to get to where you are today. How are you doing? And being genuinely interested in the response. I know a lady in the insurance, she's a young woman in the insurance industry. And the ironic part about this is, is I've known her grandpa for years, but I never knew it was her grandpa. Ah. But he's active in AA in Villa Park. And one day she was sitting in the office in the cubicle next to me, and she heard me talking about AA. And she goes, oh, she goes, what's, you know, what are you meeting? I go to one in Villa Park. She, you probably know my grandpa, my grandpa's so-and-so. I said, oh, I know him really well. That's your grandpa. I didn't know you. Over 50 years sober. Wow. Over 50 years sober. She's 25, 26. You know what she told me? She has never been to a family 
function where they have served one ounce of alcohol. Mm -hmm. No wedding, no holiday, no birthday, nothing. Because that gentleman fought so hard to get sober 50 years ago. They want to be respectful of that. Okay. She does never remember being at a family function, family party where they serve alcohol to respect the grandfather in his 50 years of sobriety. Yeah. That's incredible. That doesn't say, hey, I have your back. (laughs) Maybe that's the reason why he got the 50 years of sobriety, because of all the support that he had. Right. As opposed to what's wrong with this individual? He got the two years and then he slipped up, or he got the three years and he slipped up. Maybe because we're not changing that environment. Right. It's like, that's a lot of times the setup for everybody. It's like, hey, the environment stays the exact same. And what's the message? Like, the only thing that's got to change is you. But you're walking back into the same environment, the same people doing the same things. And you're supposed to do something different? Like, that is insanity. I mean, that is literally the definition of insanity. Yeah. So we don't want to set people up to fall back into a pattern that that automatic pilot that the brain has kind of been reinforced for quite some time to kind of go to in default mode. Yeah. We need to do things differently. You know, you'll hear, oh, you know, I'm going to have to change my friends or I can't talk to a couple of my friends because of your sobriety or because of your recovery. Well, guess what? If the extent of your relationship with your friends is, hey, let's go out on Friday or Saturday night to a bar and go drink, yeah. they ain't a friend. <laughs> they're, they're just not. Right. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're, they're not promoting necessarily the best behavior. And guess what? Just like I had to remove certain people from my my life, you might have to too. Right. It's only going to make you better in the long run. Right. And I think that's that's a way of taking care not only of yourself, but also of your significant other in that relationship if it's your spouse, loved one, right? Like whoever it is, it's kind of, it's sending a message saying like this relationship with you, this is the primary relationship I am committed to sustaining and wanting to be a part of versus saying, you know what? You're kind of all right. I just got to keep all my friends over here. And if you can't understand that, then you, I think you just need to leave. Right. Cause Uh, that sends a message. And the thing about it is, is, and I, I, I'm saying this and I'm kind of saying this jokingly, but at the same time, I'm not saying it jokingly. The wedding vows. Okay. For sickness and in health for Mm -hmm. richer, for poorer. And I say that because I was married 25 years, a little over 25 years, and my wife scurried away because I was dealing with mental health and addiction issues. But guess what? Mental health and addiction issues is sickness. Okay, we've already talked about this many, 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 many times. Okay, it's a sickness. Okay, I mean, if you're going to take that, you have to understand what that entails. Right. No different than me having to be a caretaker for my spouse if, God forbid, she's bedridden because she's dealing with dementia or Alzheimer's or, God forbid, you know, some other type of disease. It's the same concept. Right. But yet we view it differently. It's like we view everything else differently when it comes to mental health, alcohol, drugs, addiction, and so forth. Right. It's like, oh. They're, they're struggling with depression. Their depression is really bad. They can't get out versus this person's been on a two week binge and now they're just bedridden. Like, so it's their issue. Like there's yeah. a lot like compassion, right? Compassion is a huge thing. And either way, we're looking at a chronic illness and medical condition. And sometimes I think it's also knowing that certain people know their capacity and saying, you know what, I don't have that capacity to manage and navigate this and be be present in this dynamic here. And that's okay. Sure. Because... I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. No. You know? And I think this, as we're kind of like diving into this and talking about it, I think this is a time we can kind of go all day about this. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. You could probably write a book about this topic. Oh, I'll be waiting for it, Mark. Well, maybe someday. In our next podcast, Mark will read his first chapter. Uh, no. <laughs> but I, I, it'll have to be the PG version. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh wait, so we're play to the audience, Mark. Huh? <laughs> no, but 
I, as always, appreciate you sharing and really opening up and disclosing kind of like, hey, your own personal experiences. I think that that's always important. Just kind of putting putting a face to this and kind of acknowledging it, right? And diving into this because this is something that people struggle with. And it, as much education as information gets out there, one of the hardest things that people have a hard time doing in a relationship is looking at their own behavior or their own contributions to it, especially when we're talking about people who are impacted by the disease yeah. of mental illness and addiction. And so sometimes having to really assess our own contribution to certain issues in the dynamic, that could be a hard thing to kind of look at. And really what that means is saying, is this choice that I'm making, is it in the best interest of this relationship and that other person? Or sometimes it's almost saying, hey, I don't mean well, but how is this other person experiencing this choice or the words that I'm saying right now? Because it's not the intention that matters and that person's going to walk away, remember? It's going to be the impact of that yep. choice that that person is going to remember, that feeling. I can't believe they did that, right? Like that's something that's kind of left there at the end of the day when the words aren't remembered, but the feeling is experienced and still present. 100%. Couldn't say, I could not have said it better myself. That's why they pay you the big bucks. Hey, that's why I got you here, just to hype me up. So thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well. And I got you here. here you got you here making fun of my smaller shirts. Hey. Don't talk to me. Talk to your biceps, man. Uh, oh, have... yeah. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> See, look, so, at, we're really living things up here, man. We're actually talking about a serious subject. We got serious subject matter out there. And we're laughing and joking and all this stuff. I know. And uh, next week, we'll talk about your gains. So it'll be great. All right. So, I mean, <laughs> as always, we are always happy that you are all joining us on these discussions. These podcasts air on the 15th and 30th of each month. So be sure to tune in. Mark and me are open to comments and suggestions, so feel free to reach out to us at NAMI DuPage backslash podcast to connect with us, share your suggestions, get Mark's workout routine, whatever you'd like. Oh, God. Happy to share. And so, as always, <laughs> glad you all are listening and taking time out of your days to kind of join us here on these. And until next time, we will catch you and bid you adieu. So, thank you, Mark. Have a good one. Take care. Thanks for joining us today on Healing Minds, Stories of Resiliency and Recovery. If you're on the journey to find guidance and insights, subscribe now wherever you find your podcasts. Healing Minds, Stories of Resiliency and Recovery is an educational resource, not a substitute for medical or therapeutic advice. The opinions expressed by the hosts and their guests are not necessarily those of Nami DuPage. Go to namidupage.org slash podcast for links to past episodes, show notes, and to submit a question or topic ideas for a future episode. Until next time, be well.